before the sermon, <clears throat> I want to uh, just share with you a partial list of what has occurred during this year-long bicentennial celebration. This isn't complete, but it gives you an idea of what's happened. In 2016, we began with an updated pictorial directory. Uh, we published a bicentennial calendar with photos and glimpses of our past. Uh, we cleaned up the old Union Cemetery where Zadok Casey and other pioneers are buried. We had a bicentennial kickoff weekend, weekend with two special services, which included the return of many former members and staff members who now live away. We've had a bicentennial store with many uh, commemorative items and apparel. We had this contemporary praise song arranged and composed by Scott Gibbs that Dylan just sang. Remember, we wore Easter bonnets on Easter Sunday. We had an original one-person per performance by a pioneer, of a pioneer preacher's wife portrayed by Carol Dilly Jodas. It was an original uh, piece, and it was extraordinary. We've had the Bicentennial Artwork Project that Carrie's helped us with, original paintings, handcrafted, baptismal bowl and pitcher, glass-blown uh, glass chalices. We've had fifth Sunday service services throughout the year that have connected us with our heritage. Uh, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the United Methodist Church. We recognize our retired clergy as pastors of Merity. We've had two historically themed church picnics. We had a bicentennial confirmation class of, of 10 uh, youth who joined the church. We've had bicentennial moments throughout the year, which have uh, given us vignettes from our history. We've had uh, bicentennial floats in the last two fall parades. We've had this anthem uh, composed by Mark Hayes that just debuted, and I bet some of you didn't know this was coming, a fresh off the press published history of our church that is going to be uh, distributed at the luncheon. I don't want you reading during my sermon today. <laughs> I just saw this for the first time this morning, and it's extraordinary. And I think you'll want to claim your copy. Paul Whitakus has helped us tremendously with that. And the, and the truth is, we're not done yet because we are going to seal a time capsule out in the history room on December 2nd. So you want to be here that uh, Sunday. And there's still more artwork uh, that's been sponsored. Some of it's already been produced and remains to be presented to the church. Now, leading us in all of this have been four extremely dedicated, uh, passionate people and I would like them to step forward and be recognized at this time. Brett and Nancy Gibbs and David and Patty Thomas. Would you come up and stand in front of the chancel rail and face the congregation, please? Right now. Now. I managed to find a picture when we started our work together. This is the before picture of this group. I, I was 30 pounds heavier. That's the before picture, but I also took an after picture. There's the after picture when we were all done. I found the same painting with them holding glasses of beer, but I thought that might not be appropriate. But it has been work. I mean, it has been lots and lots of work and planning, but they put in a lot of passion. Uh, their love for this church, their love for God was so apparent in everything uh, they did. Uh, we have some special gifts to present uh, to each couple here. And Susie Worth, you know, is our lay leader. We have a lovely plaque that shows our appreciation. And we have a gift card for you to go out and eat and celebrate. Thank you. Just, you can't spend it on alcohol. Susie, why don't you stand up here, and I think we're going to have some pictures made real quick. Squeeze in. David, this is the last time you're getting up, okay? <laughs> Good news. Okay, happy, happy, happy. All right. Let's show our deepest heartfelt appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, guys. One other brief uh, mention I want to make before we move forward is I was told this morning that Debbie Croshan's mother uh, is in the hospital in very serious condition. So the Croshans had planned on being with us today, uh, but they've had to go to the hospital to be with her, and apparently she's very, uh, very ill. So please remember the Croshan family 
in your prayers. This morning, I want to use a piece of scripture from the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, this is one of those verses or passages that I think sometimes maybe has been used a little bit too much. We've sentimentalized it and, and uh, personalized it a bit, but it's really a, a message. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, and nothing he says is really uplifting, or very little he says is uplifting. Uh, but this is a word of hope. He speaks to the people of Israel when they are in bondage uh, and in exile in Babylon. The Lord proclaims, when Babylon's 70 years are up, I will come and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. When you search for me, yes, search for me with all your heart, you will find me. I will be present for you, declares the Lord, and I will end your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have scattered you, and I will bring you home after your long exile, declares the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Some churches, some churches have parking problems. Other churches don't. Some churches have kids running around making lots of noise, and our kids made noise today, didn't they? Other churches tend to be very quiet. In fact, you sometimes wonder if anybody's breathing. <laughs> some churches usually have more expenses than money. Other churches don't need to spend much money because, you know what, absolutely nothing is happening. Some churches are growing so much that you don't always know everybody's name. In other churches, everyone has known everybody else's name for years and years and years. Some churches enthusiastically and generously support missions and outreach other churches keep it all to themselves. Some churches are filled with tithers. Other churches are filled with tippers. <laughs> Some churches evangelize. Other churches fossilize. <laughs> Some churches are always planning for the future. Other churches remain stuck in the past. Some churches seek new ministries and new ways of doing things. Other churches resist, and you know what they say, we never did it that way before. My brothers and sisters, let me ask you this. What kind of church is God calling us to be as we enter into our third century of ministry? What kind of church are we going to be in 2019 and beyond. I'll be honest with you today. Sometimes our worship is punctuated with the sounds of crying babies or restless, busy children. And that absolutely thrills me because those are the sounds of life. There are churches that haven't heard a baby cry in their sanctuary quite literally for decades. But those are the sounds which signal the fact that we have children. We have young families in this church. Yes, occasionally we, we do struggle to pay the bills and stay on top of our budget, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing because it means that we're using and utilizing our resources in ministry. We are spending our money instead of hoarding it as if we are a savings and loan, which, believe it or not, is something a lot of churches actually do. They got money in the bank because not a blessed thing's happening. Honestly, there are days... I hope today is one of those days when it's hard to find a good parking spot. And quite often, it's in the middle of the week. But that thrills me too because that means that this church is a hub of activity in the center of this community, that stuff is happening in this place often seven days a week. Yes, this is where I'll step on toes. Yes, I hear people lament, if not outright complain, that they don't know everyone, especially since we have, God forbid, two worship services. OMG. 
A hundred years from now, they're going to wonder, what did he mean? <laughs> but you know what? If you don't know everybody's name, that might just suggest that there are more and more new people in the life of the church. And I can't think of a better problem than not knowing the name of everyone who walks through the doors of this church building. I continue to be amazed that this church has a number of people who support its work in very generous ways, folks who actually do tithe instead of tip. And I have never been in a church that is more open to talking about financial stewardship than this one. And while change is often difficult or challenging for any church, I am thrilled that we do have leadership in this church that is not averse to taking risks, nor are they so easily threatened by the possibility of change. And truthfully, my friends, while we have a wonderful, proud past, an amazing heritage, I want this church to be a church that is eager to evangelize in its third century of ministry and I do not want this to be a church that fossilizes, holding on tightly to the past. And this, my friends, is where we find ourselves in this present moment of our history. Will we evangelize? Will we continue to show and share the good news of God's saving love in Jesus Christ with a new generation of people? Or will we just fossilize? as so many traditional mainline congregations have done, simply resting on the laurels of the past until someone eventually pulls the plug on life support and they die as a congregation. And my friends, that's happening all around us. What kind of church is God calling us to be as we enter into our third century of ministry? What kind of church will we be in 2019 and beyond? Or let me ask you this. Do you believe that this church has a future. I've heard of a piece of artwork that's been displayed in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. The artist used a traditional church announcement bulletin board as his medium, uh, the old-fashioned kind with the white uh, letters and the black background. I actually Googled it and found an image of this sign which says this. It says, Evenings at 7 in the Parish Hall. Monday, Alcoholics Anonymous. Tuesday, Abused Spouses. Wednesday, Eating Disorders. Thursday, Say No to Drugs. Friday, Teen Suicide Watch. Saturday, Soup Kitchen. And then at the bottom, it says, Sunday Sermon, 9 a.m., America's Joyous Future. <laughs> Sadly, there's probably more truth in that than any of us would want to admit. admit. But again, do you believe that this church has a future. After 200 years of incredible mission and ministry in this community and beyond, what does the future hold for us? Do we have anything meaningful or urgent to offer to the world around us? Dr. Robert Hunt is on the faculty of my seminary alma mater, uh, Perkins School of Theology at SMU. He is the Director of Global Theological Education as well as Director of the Center for Evangelism. I met him about 12 years ago in person at a continuing education event in Dallas, and I was very surprised uh, to discover that we grew up near each other. We went to the same high school in Richardson, Texas, went to the same seminary, and now that he's a friend of mine on Facebook, I've also discovered that we know a lot of the same people. He's about five years older than me, and I've obviously aged much better than he has. <laughs> that gets a laugh. <laughs> Dr. Hunt has a blog which always has something interesting or provocative to think about. And a month ago, he wrote that he was thinking about writing a book. And he says, judging by what you see on the bookstore shelves, he felt that he was as qualified as anyone else to write a book. For one, he says, he's experienced hardship. He writes, my father died when I was young. I have survived serious cancer, emergency surgery in a foreign land, a serious heart and a sometimes fatal lung condition. I've been kicked out of one country for my missionary work. I've been unjustly fired in another country. I have abused my power, and I've been abused by those in power. He talks about some of his success in life. I've received many rejection letters and still published books. I've fought fat and lost weight. 
I have many plaques from civic organizations in case anyone needs hardwood and metal plates for some kind of a small craft project. I have an office suite. I have a doctor in front of my name, which students, and mis students mistakenly call me professor. And I have a great, if entirely misleading, job title. I still receive residuals from my appearances in a primetime television show. I've traveled worldwide and lived overseas for decades. And then he speculates about what kind of book he might author. He says, so maybe I could write a book about resilience and success. Maybe I could write a book about how to lose weight. I could write a book about grief and loss. I could write a book about personal transformation. I could write a tell-all confessional and a weepy tale of repentance. I could write about my privilege and, and rage against being misunderstood. I suppose I could write about recovery and survival. Then I could write about overcoming my fear of rejection by writing a book I was afraid would be rejected. I could write a book on discipline if I was disciplined enough to write a book and not a blog. Or I could write about being born in the right zip code, having a great upbringing, natural optimism, good genes, and good luck, which is less compelling and much less gratifying, but pretty much true. And then he makes this observation. Listen closely. He says, my real problem is that the book I want to write has already been written. I read it decades ago. And for decades, it has been the primary source of my teaching and speaking. It is a classic. But like most classics, it has been badly abused by academics and preachers who prefer to dissect it as a corpse rather than live within its grand story. And maybe that is why even today, Christians presently racked with anxiety haven't learned to live in that story and the one great lesson of that story. What is that book? <laughs> the Bible. And according to Dr. Hunt, the essential message of this book, the one great lesson it tells us in this grand sweep of history is simply this. You have a future. He says that's what the Bible's all about. He says, you have a future. Humanity, you have a future. United Methodists, you have a future. And then he says, when I was sweating with a diagnosis of malignant melanoma, I had a future. When I was told that it was major surgery or die in hours, I had a future. When I was told to go immediately to the ER because the test had just come in, I had a future. And because I had a future, I taught a class by Skype while I was in the emergency room. When I was told to leave the country in 24 hours and leave my family behind, we had a future. When I was told to clear out my desk and leave the office and go to another country I'd never seen, I had a future. And although I work in a United Methodist institution that, like all of them, is threatened by the unknowns we face, I believe I have a future and we have a future. My brothers and sisters, you have a future. We have a future. What do you think about that? I really don't believe the prophet Jeremiah would, would disagree a lot with this. He speaks to the southern kingdom of Israel, which has been seized and held captive in the strange land of Babylon. Their hopes, of course, have been dashed. They want God to rescue them quickly. But Jeremiah says, not now. Not now. It's going to be 70 years before your deliverance, so you might as well get comfortable. However, God says to the prophet, I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. What are God's plans for his people? To give you a future filled with hope. God is saying everything may be crappy right now, but in the long run, in the bigger picture, I'm offering you a future that is filled with hope. I am promising a better day, one that you yourself may not see or even see in your lifetime, but there is a hope and there is a purpose for your existence, even in your present day suffering. So in a real way, God is saying to this, these despairing exiled people, you have a future. I thought about doing an Oprah impression. You have a future, and you have a future, and, and you have a future. 
First United Methodist Church on this bicentennial Sunday, on this first Sunday of a new century of mission and ministry, I want you to hear this. You have a future. And it is a future that is filled with hope. Even though mainline traditional churches continue to struggle and decline, I still believe that God can use churches like ours to reach new generations of people who do not know Jesus Christ, even though the culture around us is increasingly secular and institutional religion has gotten a lot of negative and often well-deserved criticism, I believe that God has a purpose for us to reach out still to people in need of hope, in need of help, in need of the grace that flows abundantly from God's heart. Even though we may have to adapt and change, even though the culture around us is changing faster than we can keep up with, even though it might even require our own repentance, which essentially means to change our minds, I still believe that a church such as ours has a future in which we can engage people with the good news of Jesus. We can confront those elements of our culture and our society which are harmful, if not evil. And we can surely serve those whom Jesus dearly, dearly loves, the least and the last and the lost of this world. My brothers and sisters of the First United Methodist Church, please hear this today. You have a future. We have a future. And in case you doubt the potential for reaching new people and connecting with new generations in this very challenging time in our history. I want to share with you a short paragraph from a two and a half page letter that was handed to me a couple of weeks ago. It was completely and totally unexpected and it was a pure gift of grace during what had been a very challenging and difficult week. It's written by a young woman who started attending worship at our church with husband and kids during the past year. She talks about her faith journey, and then she describes what it's been like to encounter this church. She says this, and, and I'm sharing this with her information. She says, that Sunday, that Sunday that my husband, the kids, and I attended the traditional service was really the breaking point for me, for all of us. I had not felt so fulfilled in ages I sang every song at the top of my voice. I read the call and response with a fully open heart and a comprehension of the meaning behind the words, not always an easy task for me. I drank in the message with the thirst of a person who has just crossed the desert. All I could think about as I dipped my bread and consumed the body and blood was, I'm home. It repeated over and over in my mind and with every pulse of blood through my veins, a sacred mantra and my own personal prayer. I'm home. First United Methodist Church, you have a future. It is a future that God is offering us today. It is a future that is filled with hope and pregnant with possibilities. While I am amazed by the remarkable legacy of this congregation over the past 200 years, I am even more excited about what God might have in store for us in the next century of our life together. First United Methodist Church, if you didn't hear me say it already, let me say it one more time. You have a future, and it is a future that is filled with hope. Let us pray. Our living, loving, eternal God, we do thank you for this great church and the thousands of lives whom this church's ministry has impacted over the course of 200 years. We thank you, God, for those pioneer ancestors who planted the seeds and, and for the countless people and pastors who've watered and nourished this church through the years. But we know that all life, all growth, anything that is good has come from you. So as we enter into our third century as a congregation, help us to claim the future that you desire for us. Help us to know that you continue to have a purpose for our existence. And the future is indeed one that is filled with hope. It is pregnant with possibilities. For all you've done and for all you'll continue to do, dear God, in us and through us, we give you our heartfelt thanks and praise. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Remember our app, our website, findhopedowntown.org, through which you can give, uh, stay connected, or watch sermon videos that you might have missed.